today's uh, uh, first day of the meeting. And our first speaker is Luis Belot Rubio from IAEA Granada, Spain. And uh, as the title of his talk suggests, he will be talking about photospheric magnetic fields, uh, most specifically challenges ahead. So yeah, we are starting a bit early, but I'm not sure at least you want to wait a minute or two. <laughs> Yeah, maybe we can maybe we can wait for uh, one minute. Yeah, oh, sure. <clears throat> Hello, Luis. Uh, how are you? I'm fine. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, long time no see. Yeah, well, hopefully in the near future, we will be able to meet again. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. These are very difficult times, Yeah, sure. actually. Sure, sure. Yeah. OK, uh, I think I can start now. Uh, yes, please, go ahead. Yes, uh, well, hello, everyone. Um, uh, the first thing I would like to, to do is uh, thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to give this talk. Uh, on a very special occasion. It's the golden jubilee of the Indian Institute of Astrophysics. Um, I have very good memories of uh, IIA. Uh, my first scientific conference um, was the Solar Polarization Workshop 2 that was organized by IIA in Bangalore in October of uh, 1998. And at that time, I presented an inversion code I had developed uh, during my thesis to uh, invert um, unresolved uh, uh, magnetic elements in the quiet sun. Those were tough uh, times. Um, I uh, want to stress the, the word unresolved here because we had spectrobolarimetric observations uh, uh, with a spatial resolution of uh, around one arc second. And uh, with this spatial resolution, we couldn't really separate the magnetic elements from uh, the surroundings. So we had to develop um, uh, specific tools uh, to infer the properties of, of those elements. Now in this uh, slide, I'm showing you the improvements in uh, spatial resolution of our spectropolarimetric observations since then, 22 uh, years uh, ago. Um, in 1999, uh, the Tenerife Infrared Polarimeter uh, saw first light and uh, it pro provided us with spectropolarimetric observations um, at one arc second resolution with the help, help of tip, tilt correction. Uh, then in 2003, the diffraction limited spectropolarimeter came into operation, producing spectropolarimetric observations at 0.6 arc seconds. And, and now we can see uh, the intergranular lanes very well. Finally, in 2006, the Hino the, spectro, uh, uh, the spacecraft was launched and um, it carries a grating spectrograph uh, capable of delivering uh, measurements of at 0.32 arc seconds. Uh, here you have um, observations of this uh, spectropolarimeter. And in this um, zooming uh, area, you can see uh, individual magnetic elements, this bright point here, and also uh, magnetic sheets uh, in the intergranular lanes. So along uh, there has been uh, a long progress since uh, the, the old times. And uh, in this talk, I'm going to, um, to focus mainly on the results of uh, grading spectropolarimeters uh, using high resolution observations. This is the outline of my talk. I will first describe the properties of uh, quiet sun magnetic fields because I consider that uh, quiet sun magnetic fields represent uh, um, the, the most uh, challenging problem uh, to determine photospheric magnetic fields. I will talk about the temporal evolution of uh, those quiet sun fields. 
I will pay some uh, attention to magnetic coupling of the solar photosphere mediated by two processes, flux emergence and cancellation processes. I will describe the challenges ahead and the tools we have to tackle uh, those challenges, including Stokes inversion codes and uh, new instruments. And if I have some time, I will uh, give you a very brief update on the European Solar Telescope. Now, uh, this is uh, the quiet sun as observed with the you know, um, spectropolarimeter. It's a 50 centimeter telescope in space producing scene free observations. Uh, the um, uh, spatial resolution is 0.3 arc seconds. It's uh, stable and um, homogeneous, consistent. Uh, this is the corresponding um, circular polarization map. You can see that the uh, solar surface is uh, fully covered uh, with magnetic fields. The strongest fields um, outline uh, the boundaries of the magnetic network, and it's uh, essentially um, a region where we find vertical fields, kilogauss fields. In the interior of uh, supergranules, we see tiny magnetic elements of uh, both polarities. These are the so-called internetwork magnetic elements. So using the, the observations from Hinode, we have um, determined the magnetic properties of internetwork uh, fields. Um, here in this uh, slide, I'm giving you uh, the distributions of field strengths uh, presented by several authors using different analysis techniques, uh, most of them based on uh, Miller-Linton inversions like these three, and also spatially coupled inversions like this uh, here. Um, well, you can see that most of the analysis agree that internetwork magnetic fields are weak for the most part. The peak of the distributions is uh, in between 100, 200 Gauss. These are the uh, distributions of uh, field inclinations in the, in the internetwork um, by different authors. Again, different techniques too. And uh, you can see that uh, all of them indicate very inclined uh, internet work fields. The peak of the distributions in all cases, um, it's reached at 90 degrees. Inclinations are measured with respect to the local vertical. So uh, zero and eight, uh, 180 degrees indicate vertical fields and 90 degrees indicate purely horizontal fields. So. All uh, the distributions agree that there's a, um, a large fraction of inclined fields, but uh, the details uh, are uh, under the debate. So in particular, the, the, the shape of the distributions may um, match an isotropic distribution or not. Some authors uh, support uh, isotropic distributions of field strengths, but others um, suggest uh, the distribution is not isotropic. Why is there this um, um, disagreement between authors? Well, because uh, determining the magnetic properties of uh, internet world fields is quite complicated. We have to analyze very weak polarization signals. And we know that uh, noise in uh, Stokes Q and U artificially increases the inclination of the magnetic field. This was first pointed out by, by Borrero and Cobell in 2011. If we go to a normal map uh, taken by the Hinode SP, we will see that only 25% of the pixels have strong circular polarization signals larger than 4.5 times uh, the noise level. But only 2% of the pixels will show linear polarization above 4 times, 4.5 times uh, the noise level. And we know that we need to include these linear polarization signals to constrain the vector magnetic field, and in particular, uh, the inclination. Now, what can we do to, to uh, include this information? Well, uh, 
we have to uh, increase the polarimetric sensitivity. A few years ago, we performed an experiment using you know, the SP, sit and stare observations. Uh, with a single slit position, we can uh, increase the effective exposure time from uh, 9.6 seconds to 67 seconds up to 9.76 minutes. Um, so uh, these are uh, the Stokes Q U and V spectra along the slit. And when you do that integration, you start to see, you start to reduce the, the noise level significantly, and you start to see linear polarization signals everywhere. Uh, if you go to the to the panel panel on the right, you will see that uh, the whole slit shows clear uh, linear polarization signals, and uh, Stokes V is present everywhere. So these numbers here give the percentage of uh, pixels having Stokes Q or U signals above 4.5 uh, times the the noise level. With an integration of 10 minutes, we mm, see strong linear signals uh, in more than half of the field of view. However, this is a very long integration and the spatial resolution is degraded, of course. And it's bad because we know that uh, quiet sun uh, fields are extremely dynamic. This is a, a time sequence of uh, magnetograms taken by the Hinode narrowband filter imager for about 20 hours. The cadence here is 20 seconds, and you see that uh, the quiet sun is, is really very dynamic. You see uh, network cells uh, with uh, network elements uh, moving around and interacting with each other. And inside the supergranular cell, we see tiny magnetic elements that appear continuously all over the place and start to migrate radially outwards to the network. On their way to the network, they interact with other magnetic elements of opposite polarity, and they even uh, can disappear. So uh, this uh, figure here shows or summarizes the main surface processes undergone by internet work quite uh, some fields. Um, here you have the flux appearance rate as a function of uh, time over 40 hours inside the supergranular cell I, I showed before. It is quite constant at 120 Maxwell, Maxwell per square centimeter per day. Uh, I would like to mention that using higher resolution sunrise, sunrise IMAX data, Smith and co-workers found a 10 times larger flux appearance rate. Uh, so these um, these numbers may even be large, much larger than than uh, indicated by the by the Hinode NFI. Uh, the lower panel shows the sinks of internet work flux. Uh, these are the processes that remove internet work flux from the interior of supergranular cells. The most important mechanism is fading followed by flux transfer to the, to the network, which is very important uh, with 47 Maxwell per square centimeter per day, and also cancellation processes. Now, uh, these surface processes uh, couple the various uh, layers of the solar atmosphere, atmosphere in a very um, uh, effective way. And there are two main processes, magnetic flux emergence, that brings magnetic energy and magnetic flux to the solar surface, and magnetic flux cancellation that removes magnetic flux from the, from the surface. And both of them can drive a magnetic reconnection, not only in the photosphere, but also higher up. So it's important for the energetics and dynamics of the atmosphere. We need to understand them if we want to uh, get a better knowledge of uh, the whole system. So what do we know about a flux emergence in the quiet sun? Uh, this is an um, observation by the Hinode spectropolarimeter um, at a cadence of 30 seconds. And here you have 
uh, intensity maps, uh, linear polarization maps, and circular polarization maps. Um, according to Gossage and collaborators, about 65% of the total magnetic flux that appears in the internetwork appears in, in bipolar form. And I'm going, going to show you uh, with this example uh, one of such uh, one of such um, uh, flux emergence uh, processes. So the first thing we observe is linear polarization above a granule. Uh, this uh, patch of linear polarization increases and grows with time, and very soon we observe two patches of circular polarization of opposite polarities flanking the linear polarization signal. Here, so you see the two uh, the two um, uh, circular polarization patches. They separate from each other, migrating towards the uh, adjacent uh, intergranular lanes. And two minutes after the linear signal is observed, it disappears from 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 the surface. We can understand this process as the emergence of a small scale magnetic omega loop in the atmosphere. In this diagram by Gomori and, and, and uh, collaborators, uh, we can see uh, one such uh, omega loop uh, rising into the solar atmosphere. Uh, first, at, at the beginning, we observe the apex of the, of the magnetic loop with horizontal fields. These horizontal fields produce the uh, linear polarization. As the loop rises, we quickly uh, detect the two foot points uh, producing the circular polarization patches of opposite polarities. And then uh, after some uh, time, the, the loop uh, or the, the top of the loop goes uh, above the line formation region here and uh, the linear polarization disappears. Uh, in a very recent uh, and interesting paper by Fisher and uh, co-workers, uh, they used high-resolution uh, data taken by the CRISP instrument at the Swedish Solar Telescope uh, to locate the position of these linear polarization signals above granules. And they found uh, strong linear signals on granular lanes uh, where the transverse field uh, may be up to 300 uh, Gauss. These granular lanes are produced by horizontal vortex uh, tubes that um, uh, are created at the edges of granules and uh, move towards the granular uh, interior. Um, these uh, vortex tubes uh, provide a mechanism to bring dispersed flux from uh, the adjacent um, intergranular lanes into the, the, the granule. And uh, this mechanism is maybe important uh, for uh, local uh, dynamo uh, action to take place on the solar surface. So um, this is a really important result uh, that has been published uh, just um, three months ago. Now, these uh, bipolar uh, flux uh, regions uh, emerge into the solar surface, but they continue rising in the atmosphere. About 25% of the uh, small scale magnetic loops observed to emerge in the um, uh, quiet sun internet work uh, reach the photosphere. And this is an example taken by the CRISP instrument at the Swedish Solar Telescope. Uh, the three lines uh, shown here sample the whole atmosphere from the low photosphere, the upper photosphere, and the low chromosphere. This is uh, Stokes I, Q, U, and V. And you can see in the last column uh, the appearance of a um, small scale loop uh, with uh, the two foot points indicated by uh, the red and, 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 and blue circles. I'm gonna stop the movie here for you to, let me go here. So this is the appearance of the loop. 
Uh, we see linear polarization in between the two um, foot points. Um, if we go a bit backwards here. So you see the two foot points uh, in the low photosphere, but not yet in the magnesium B2 line sampling the upper photosphere. So the tube is rising, uh, but there's some delay until we see it in the upper photosphere and then in, in the chromosphere. So one minute after the appearance uh, in the photosphere, the loop uh, gets to the formation height of the 52, uh, 5173 line. And a few minutes later, we also see the, the signals uh, in the chromosphere. Now, uh, we know that small, small scale magnetic loops uh, can reach the photosphere. They transport magnetic energy and magnetic flux to those layers. And the, actually, the, uh, in the energy uh, flux is quite significant. It might be sufficient to balance radiative losses in the chromosphere. But this is just an estimate, not direct measurements, uh, because we cannot uh, determine the magnetic field at chromospheric levels, uh, which is necessary uh, to know if this energy is released and how it is released. Uh, but what we know is that emerging magnetic fields interact with ambient fields uh, through cancellation with opposite polarity fields. This is probably the signature of magnetic reconnection. Uh, and if so, it will determine the magnetic uh, and dynamic and energetics of the um, atmosphere locally. So we know that 20% of the total internetwork flux disappears by cancellation. And these cancellations often occur to, uh, often occur near the, the uh, magnetic network where we see strong uh, chromospheric brightness. This is an example from the Hinode narrowband filter imager. Uh, we have um, small, um, uh, small, uh, um, uh, white polarity internet network patches uh, interacting with uh, this uh, big uh, network patch. And at some point we see a very bright um, uh, enhancement uh, in the chromosphere as seen by SDO in the helium 304 line. These brightness um, might be caused by rearrangement of magnetic field lines leading to magnetic reconnection, uh, formation of current sheets, and uh, energy release by uh, dissipation, which leads to gas, gas heating. This um, uh, process is uh, possible, but it's very difficult to confirm because we don't have um, magnetic measurements in the in the uh, chromosphere. This is a magnetofrictional simulation of the example I showed you before. Uh, this is the, the white internet network patch. It's connected to the network patch. And you see that during the evolution, the field lines interact uh, not only at photospheric levels, but also higher up. And this could uh, produce magnetic reconnection, but we need to confirm that. There are other examples of the interaction of uh, uh, opposite polarity magnetic elements at the edge of um, uh, this the network. The, the white uh, the internet this, network patch uh, is a very nice paper by uh, Samantha, published in Science, uh, where they uh, use uh, Goody Solar Telescope observations to um, observe the formation of enhanced specular activity at the border of the network uh, in the presence of opposite polarity uh, magnetic field elements. So this is a sequence of H-alpha images and the contours show the corresponding uh, magnetic fields uh, with blue indicating a negative polarity and red indicating uh, positive polarity. So uh, when uh, this patch, this red patch interacts with the network patch of opposite polarity, a spicule is formed. And uh, from observations by AIA, uh, energy is released, is indicated at the top of some of these uh, spicules. 
Again, magnetic reconnection between emerging flux of opposite polarity and the network, uh, overlying network uh, field lines is very plausible that uh, needs to be confirmed directly in the future. This is another example of the cancellation of opposite polarity fields, this time in the quiet sign internetwork. Here we have uh, a high resolution uh, time sequence taken by the CRISP instrument and iris observations. This is a magnetogram in the magnesium B2 line as a function of time. We see two tiny patches of opposite polarities coming together and canceling. This cancellation produces brightenings, strong brightenings in calcium 8542, but also in the slit jaw uh, images uh, taken by, by iris. Uh, from uh, the um, uh, inversion of the um, uh, intensity profiles uh, observed with iris, uh, these authors came to the conclusion that the local temperature is increased uh, up to 200 Kelvin between lockdown minus four and minus 6.5 in this area here. Uh, so this temperature increase is sufficient to explain the radiative losses in the chromosphere locally, but not globally, because there are too few cancellations at the spatial resolution and the sensitivity of the uh, Swedish Solar Telescope. Now, Luis, you are okay. left with five minutes more. Yes, yes, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, finish soon. So these are uh, the challenges ahead. I think the key, key, uh, key uh, science questions uh, would be to determine the magnetic energy and magnetic flux of the, of the solar atmosphere, the solar photosphere. We need to understand surface processes, particularly flux emergence and cancellation. We need to decide if cancellations are the signature of magnetic reconnection. We need to evaluate the role of photospheric fields in chromospheric and coronal heating. And this means we have to quantify the energy released in the upper layers. In my opinion, we need to go from uh, uh, qualitative to quantitative an analysis by characterizing the magnetic topology of these uh, processes. We have to demonstrate using this magnetic topology that the processes actually happen and we need to locate the height where they occur. Uh, it all comes down to determining the vector magnetic field at different heights uh, by means of multi-line spectropolarimetric observations and uh, analysis based on the Stokes inversion codes. So today we have an array of um, inversion codes that we can use uh, to um, interpret our polarimetric observations. Uh, they serve different purposes from accurate non lt calculations to very fast analysis um, for real-time inversions of data at the telescope. And I would like to, to mention that the non lt codes, um, Nicole, Stick, Stick and Desar, that are being uh, developed, developed right now will be the uh, most import, important tools uh, to analyze the observations in the near future. Now, uh, this is an example of what you can do when you have uh, um, very powerful inversion codes. It's uh, uh, an analysis of Hinode observations by Bueller and coworkers in which they applied a spatially coupled inversion to determine the 3D magnetic and dynamic structure of uh, flux tubes in plush regions. And these are vertical cuts of the magnetic field, inclination and velocity um, uh, in one such flux tube. They observe uh, magnetic elements expanding with height uh, with vertical fields in the uh, center and more inclined fields towards a canopy. And they find very strong downflows outside of, uh, of the flux tube in the deep layers, but also some, um, some uh, downflows inside the, the magnetic uh, uh, interior um, in the deep layers. There are more examples, but I don't have much time. So um, what is the way forward for quite some magnetic field studies? Well, 
I think we need to increase the magnetic sensitivity of the measurements. We have to uh, get to 10 to the minus four to detect the weakest polarization signals, in particular, the linear signals. We need to keep high spatial resolution because most of these structures and processes occur at scales of on the order of 75 kilometers or so, or even less. So 0.1 gar second seems reasonable. In reality, we have to stay away from the fraction limit in order to ensure high polarimetric sensitivity. Then we have uh, to, uh, we need to study the temporal evolution of these structures. For that, we need a cadences of 30 seconds. Uh, the goal would be 10 seconds and a multi-line spectropolarimetry for studying the magnetic coupling of the solar atmosphere. This will be possible with the next generation solar telescopes. Uh, in particular, they will provide very high polarimetric sensitivity. We have three main uh, telescopes coming online soon. DICIST is a four meter aperture telescope now in commissioning phase. And in the longer term, we have the Indian National Large Solar Telescope, which is a two meter telescope led by IIA. The land has been already purchased in the Pangon So Lake. And finally, we have EST, which is a four meter telescope now in the preparatory phase for uh, construction. Uh, there will be a talk uh, on DICIS by Fega uh, this uh, afternoon another talk uh, by Ravinda, Ravindra on uh, the Indian NLST. And uh, I wanted to say something about EST here, but I don't have time. And so I will leave this, uh, this slide as my last slide because it shows uh, one of the main uh, changes in the optical design of the telescope, which has been uh, included recently, it's the use of an active secondary mirror here. This active secondary mirror means that uh, the optical design of the EST will be much simpler with only six mirrors and a doublet lens instead of 14 mirrors, which will give a much higher photon throughput. Uh, an MCAO will be integrated in the telescope with five deformable mirrors, which will be, be which will be polarimetrically compensated. This is necessary uh, to uh, uh, perform studies of the magnetic coupling of the solar atmosphere with multi-line spectropolarimetry at high sensitivity, spatial, and temporal resolution. And I think I'm going to stop here. <laughs> Thank you, Luis, for such a nice review of uh, quite some photospheric magnetic field and the challenges ahead. So I will now open the floor for question, and Sridhar will lead that. Uh, there are already two questions in the chat box, one by uh, Rajguru and two by, by Oscar Steiner. Uh, Rajguru, do you want to unmute and ask the question? Or Oh, okay, so I typed in the question, but then later, uh, Louis, later slides kind of answered me. I was a little confused about what exactly is the meaning of fading. We say fading of magnetic flux distinct from cancellation and dispersal. Fading. Ah, oh, fading. Are you talking about fading? Yeah, yes, yes. Yes. Yes, well, um, uh, <laughs> This is a very interesting process. Uh, what we see is a magnetic element uh, that evolves with time and just disappears from the surface without interacting, interacting with any other uh, magnetic element in the surroundings. Um, it's the opposite process to the appearance of magnetic flux uh, in situ without any other uh, magnetic element in the surrounding. We think, um, it might be this fading process might be related to uh, the dispersal of, of the magnetic field below uh, our sensitivity level. So we don't see the magnetic element anymore. The flux is there, but it's too dispersed and we don't see it. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is the uh, Oscar Strainer. Do you want to unmute and ask? Okay. Uh, Hello. Hi. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. I, 
I, I wrote it down actually in the chat. Uh, uh, I just uh, came to my mind when you mentioned that uh, these small scale magnetic fields uh, have a very short time scale. Yeah? Then you integrate with heat order over 10 minutes. Now imagine that a vertical magnetic field moves across the uh, field of view. Could that introduce a linear polarization signal somehow? Uh, yes, yes, uh, you are absolutely right. And uh, this, I would say, it's a last ditch attempt until we have uh, larger telescopes. Uh, so we did this uh, integration uh, just to, uh, to see if uh, there were linear polarizations um, in the, in the um, if we could see some linear polarization, okay? The process you mentioned may produce artificial uh, uh, linear signals, you are right, but I would like you, I would like you to compare uh, these two panels, the, the, the integrations, the 67 second integration versus the 10 minute integration, right? And uh, look at the Stokes Q, for example. Most of the signals you, you see here very well because the, the noise level is, is, is uh, very, very low, are already present uh, in the 67 second integration. You can, you can, uh, you have glimpses of it, okay? So they are present already in the short integrations. Uh, but um, I don't know. I, I agree with you, some of the weakest uh, sig linear signals we see in the longer integrations might be caused by uh, different magnetic structures crossing the, um, the, the, the slit and producing linear polarization. But we will soon know uh, when uh, Dickies comes online and uh, we can uh, reach this noise level with integrations of uh, five seconds or 10 seconds instead of 10 minutes. Okay, uh, there is one more question from Oscar. Well, yes, uh, I, I, uh, this was a very nice slide with the list of all the codes that are available for uh, polarimetry. There was not listed the Porta code and I wondered if this is uh, if if uh, this has some reason, uh, well, uh, my understanding is that the port. Uh, you are right. The porta code is uh, also available, but it's uh, more oriented to the analysis of um, Hanley measurements, and whereas I focused on uh, Seman. Uh, measurements. But you are right. I mean, uh, another very important challenge for the future will be to study the weakest fields uh, in, in the quiet sun, and they are likely to produce uh, important handless signals in lines like uh, the strontium line uh, that will require the use of a Hanley inversion code. And the Porta code is one of them. Another one is the Hazel code by Asensio Ramos and co-workers. Okay. Okay. So these are essentially, these are essentially uh, Seaman uh, codes. Okay, thank you. So let us have the last question from Dan Mai. Uh, hi, Luis, very nice talk. Thank so you. I wanted to ask about, uh, so you talk about quiet sun. But uh, when look, we look at the quiet sun and coronal hole, particularly in the uh, in the like atmosphere, we see like similar kind of spicule or similar kind of activities. In terms of magnetic activity, what uh, uh, is defined in the coronal hole compared to quiet sun? And when, uh, like, uh, at what height do you think the scenario changes? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know exactly. <laughs> I don't know exactly. My uh, 
my guess is that um, uh, you also see um, activity in, in coronal whole regions uh, because of the very, um, very weak magnetic fields uh, in the internet world, which are present there, uh, but we still don't see because of lack of uh, polarimetric sensitivity. But uh, I think uh, um, an answer to that question will only come with uh, the large uh, aperture telescopes like Dickies and uh, EST. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we can wind up and go to the next speaker. Thank okay. you, Luis, for your nice talk and nice question and answer session. So Thank now you. we will move to next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Lakshmi Pradeep Chitta, and he will be actually presenting about the role of surface magnetic field evolution in coronal hazing. So it's up to you now, Lakshmi. Hello, can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, Firstly, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak here. And uh, thanks to Luis for setting the stage uh, for my talk. Uh, so Luis prominently talked about the quite some magnetic fields. Now then let me drift to active regions and then uh, describe the role of surface magnetic field evolution in impulsive coronal heating. So our current understanding of active regions are uh, plasma heating in general uh, is that these are produced by nanoflares. Now, nanoflares are individual heating events that can have energies of 10 to the 24 ergs, and each nanoflare can heat the plasma to several million Kelvin. And there are also reports that these nanoflares actually can produce non-thermal particles at relativistic speeds. So the cartoon for the nanoflares is envisioned by Parker, which is uh, one of the iconic cartoons in solar physics. The cartoon is very simple. When you have a loop that is tied to two photospheric points and the turbulent convection can wind the magnetic field like this and the crisscrossing of the magnetic fields produce current sheets and then these reconnect and then produce the nano flares. And that is what I illustrated here further. So you have a coronal loop that extends between two polarities, positive and negative polarities, and then motions at these foot points then wind the magnetic fields and these generate coronal heating through reconnection and this will then deposit the energy at the foot points and the foot points will brighten giving rise to the uh, telltale signatures of the nanoflares and we have a chromospheric evaporation and then the loop fills and this is the typical uh, progression of events when we think about uh, coronal heating. In fact, there are signatures of uh, variable foot point emission when a loop becomes bright. And that is uh, shown here. So here is a section of a loop. And then this red overlay shows uh, the transition region emission at the foot point of that loop system. And if we take any pixel and then plot the light cursor from that region, they show very high variability on time scales of 100 seconds. So the whole duration is about 300 seconds. And then we can actually see the variability over a wide uh, range of solar atmospheric layers from the chromosphere into the corona. Now, if we look at the full picture, things will become even more interesting and also more uh, clearer. Now, what I showed pre previously is this impulse is actually the indication of this heating event or the brightening that you see on a very long and steady evolution that is happening at the foot point here that is shown in yellow. But if we look at the conjugate foot point that is connecting the loop, we have a different picture. So there the emission is very rapid and also highly dynamic. It is nothing like what we see in the other side of the foot point. But if we look at the signatures in the very hot plasma at 7 million Kelvin, both foot points show near simultaneous evolution. Now, if we look at only the hot sections of the loop and then study their foot point responses, we would imagine that there is some sort of reconnection at somewhere in the coronal height. 
and that deposits the energy at both foot points near simultaneously and then the simultaneous brightening of the foot points occur but only by incorporating the other uh, information now in this case the foot point information coming from the transition region we tend to see that there are actually differences and one foot point is very dynamic and the other foot point is steady for a long time, but then shows a dynamic signature uh, coincidental with the actual loop heating itself. So why is this foot point so dynamic? Interestingly enough, that foot point directly overlies a flux cancellation site. Now, Lewis has talked very nicely about the Quietson flux cancellation and its role in chromospheric heating. And now what I'm showing is uh, flux cancellation in the context of nano flares and heating of plasma to several million Kelvin. And if we plot uh, the magnetic flux integrated over a uh, function of time in this region, we find that the flux is steadily decreasing for a period of two hours. And above the flux cancellation site, there are quite a bit of uh, disturbances that happen in the transition region. And those disturbances then eventually uh, lead to the heating of the loop suddenly uh, to several million Kelvin. So the coronal heating picture means that you have to also understand uh, the large scale extent of the loop and its magnetic connectivity. Then probably we can find interesting signatures of reconnection and the origin of reconnection uh, connected to the magnetic field evolution itself. But the question is, is foot point reconnection common? First, let me back up and then show that when you take uh, an active region and plot its uh, uh, emission at a very high temperatures of 7 million Kelvin, it shows quite a bit of impulsive activity for several days. Now, in this case, I show uh, in the white color uh, the proxy of iron-18 uh, derived from uh, AIA observations that shows quite a bit of impulsive activity. And I compared those with... Uh, the GOES uh, disintegrated uh, X-ray flux. And you can clearly see that uh, the GOES that actually is uh, detecting flares um, of uh, very, uh, that produce very hot plasma is all the signal that we see in GOES is also seen directly into the core of this active region, meaning that we are able to pinpoint the source of GOES signal to this particular active region core, where the plasma is repeatedly heated to several million Kelvin uh, for a, pr a prolonged periods of time. Your slides are not moving. Is not moving now? Yeah. Which slide are you in, sorry? We are in that uh, flux cancellation gradually. Okay. Uh, OS, let me... OS thing hasn't come. So. Okay, so let me unshare and share again. Sorry. Maybe there is some delay. Yeah, no. So do you see my screen again? Yes. Okay. Uh, so now do you see? Probably that was the problem at the end of... Professor Venkat Krishnan, I think for all the others, it's okay. It's moving. Oh, okay. 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 Sorry. Sorry for the confusion then. Um, yes. So then most of you saw this slide. Uh, uh, so this is for one particular active region. And now the same thing for a different active region. So here too, uh, when I plot the time series of uh, the very high emission um, in white, that can be compared with the ghost fluctuations, then you can see that... Uh, the source of GOES X-ray flux can be traced to the active region itself. Now, let us take a look at uh, one particular event uh, among all these fluctuations. And let's say we are looking at a, uh, an, a fluctuation at this time. Now, that fluctuation is caused by a loop system like this, which is heated to several million Kelvin. If you look at the coronal images, the loop system looks fairly simple, and there is no uh, information about how it might have arised from the photospheric magnetic fields. But then if we compare that with uh, HMI magnetograms, um, what we find is that the underlying magnetic field is very complex, even though the coronal loop overlying is quite simple. 
So we developed uh, a, an automated method to detect the foot points of the loop. So our method detects one foot point per loop system and then places it on the magnetogram for us to analyze the magnetic fields in an automated way. And what we found is that in this case, the detected foot point identified with this red contour actually overlies again the site of flux emergence and cancellation. And interestingly, the other foot point, which is in this case here, is also directly overlying a mixed polarity region. So this just suggests that the complex magnetic fields can give rise to simpler uh, systems of loops, uh, and uh, most of the action then must be happening due to the uh, flux emergence and cancellation at the base. Then you can ask me, what about this little brightening that we see at the end? That's also that there is a positive polarity magnetic field and then a negative polarity magnetic field slowly drifts towards that and then gives rise to this uh, very hot plasma that even imprinted in the ghost, uh, a very tiny signal. But are these um, mixed polarity magnetic fields important? Uh, do they really indicate reconnection? So for that, we compared these observations with iris which provides plasma flow information so that we can actually see a reconnection jets and so on. So for example, on the one side where we found mixed polarity magnetic fields, we found that the transition region emission shows quite broad profiles um, that can reach to plus or minus 200 kilometers Doppler shifts, 200 kilometers per second Doppler shifts, meaning that there is a significant plasma heating at the same time also uh, 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 plasma uh, jets from the site of reconnection. For comparison, I show the quite sun profile in this very uh, thick white line. Um, it is so small that it's not even in the plot. So I multiplied it by a factor of 10. So you can imagine the significant heating that is producing this green uh, uh, spectral profile that is coming from the mixed polarity region. On the other side, where our method detected the mixed polarity region, there too, when we compared with the quiet sun, the profiles in the magnesium line now indicating even deeper heating in the chromosphere are significantly enhanced. All this suggests that the bidirectional flows and chromospheric heating are clear signatures of reconnection when you have hot loops. And uh, this all needs to be taken into account when we try to understand nanoflare heating. So we did a statistics of several uh, loop systems and found that for a dominant uh, ma uh, majority of the loops, in this case, more than 73%, at least one of the foot points is in the region of mixed magnetic polarities. And we found that from the core of the loop foot point, we only have to go three megameters away to encounter the first opposite polarity magnetic field for a majority of the loop system. Meaning that if these are actually interacting, the compared to the length of the loop, the height of reconnection is very low in the solar atmosphere. And within the limitations of HMM uh, magnetic fields, uh, uh, because of the spatial resolution and sensitivity, we were able to um, provide or calculate uh, the rate of change of magnetic flux and found that uh, there is a significant variation in magnetic flux uh, during the time uh, when uh, the coronal heating happens. So, uh, Pradeep, you have five, three minutes more. Yes, Sorry. yes. Uh, so when you have a loop like this, we cannot simply talk, talk anymore about the braiding and then the nanoflare heating. We also have to understand that the loops are continually being interacted by opposite magnetic polarities at the base of the coronal loop foot point. And this actually gives rise to a framework that we developed uh, to understand the energy liberation at the base of the foot points in this sequence. When two polarities start interacting, they create a null point in the photosphere. And as they come closer, the null point uh, expands into the atmosphere. And this null point then gets stretched into a thin current sheet. And this current sheet is then uh, governing the reconnection that is what we see as a coronal heating later on. And we calculated the height of reconnection. And what we found is that for most relevant magnetic features from network regions to sunspots, the height of reconnection in different varieties of overlying fields is well below four megameters, meaning that most of the reconnection must be taking place in the chromosphere. And with this, I would like to give you the 
um, key conclusions. So when we talk about coronal nanoplays, we have to then also think about the interaction of surface magnetic fields, and this will provide a complete information of coronal heating to several million Kelvin. And the other uh, take home message is that chromospheric reconnection is playing a key role in governing uh, the, uh, the coronal heating itself. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Pradeep, for such a nice talk and overview about the coronal heating uh, in terms of surface magnetic fields. So the floor is open for questions and uh, Sridhar Ran will take care of that. I don't see any hands raised. There's a ah, question yeah, by said, Kamlesh yes, Bora. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Kamlesh, can you uh, unmute and ask? Yeah, I think there is one from Durkesh and another is from Krishna Prasad. So, Dur Durkesh, can you unmute and ask? Yeah, hi, Pradeep. Uh, thank you for the nice talk. Um, it was very interesting. Um, so, I have. Uh, Two questions, rather. Uh, one is that uh, uh, for the regions, I mean, when you mentioned that chromospheric heating is important, I think that is that is already uh, quite well demonstrated, not only observations, but in simulations where you see emerging flux regions reconnecting and all. Um, but their role into putting uh, plasma by direct reconnection in, coronal, uh, in chromosphere are through chromospheric evaporation when you have the, the coronal heating going on in the corona. What sort of cooling time scales you would have? Because um, uh, chromosphere is a very strong radiator, right? So uh, you put in energy, chromosphere will try to get rid of by radiation rather than making the plasma unstable and flow up. So do you have any handle on that? Um, from so it area? all depends on... Uh how the magnetic field is locally and globally coupled. So if the magnetic field is completely coupled and closed within the chromosphere, then yes, you are right that once you put in the energy, the chromosphere basically radiates and nothing gets channeled to the corona. But in these cases, uh, for these loops, there is already a coronal field that is being developed by the large scale flux emergence itself. And with to those, um, established coronal channels, the chromospheric reconnection will then guide some of the energy into the corona itself. Now, as I showed in one of the examples in the beginning, if you dump energy at one foot point, the signals can be then traced to the other foot points and both can simultaneously show uh, the uh, heating signatures. Now, the other foot point can then uh, basically uh, evaporate uh, the chromospheric ablation process and the foot point where the reconnection can take place, uh, taking place can drive the flows into the loop. So this is a complex interplay. Now the heating, the time scales depend on the length of the loop and the energy for, uh, that, that, that we deposit. For these kind of hot loops, the heating is very rapid, prob uh, the cooling is rapid, and most of the times we see the plasma to be at few million Kelvin than seven million Kelvin. The seven million Kelvin plasma cools very quickly. And then we see a very slow cooling process. But that is in the corona. That is in the corona. Yes. Also, also the the uh, one foot point heating uh, versus the other. Mm -hmm. I mean, that could also be explained just by asymmetric heating uh, in the loops, right? I mean, uh, they yes, don't. So have the asymmetric have a, heating. I mean, the reconnection does not have to take place right at the top. No, no. Here, what I'm saying is that the reconnection is the primary reconnection is taking place at one of the foot points. And that can give rise to the asymmetric heating that you just described, yes. Right. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. Okay. The next question by Krishna Prasad. Can you unmute and ask? Yeah. Uh, hi, Pradeep. Excellent uh, talk. Uh, I, I, I just have a, a one question that um, uh, the way uh, you identify a loop which is being heated and then you look at the foot point and there is mixed polarity, but I'm thinking just uh, other way, what if you look other way around, there are, like if you look at this particular map, you, you can see there are many, many places that uh, mixed polarity is interacting. So would you expect loops to form at those locations? Yes, uh, uh, that also again, like uh, how um, Durgesh asked, uh, so magnetic field 
only 5% of the field is actually coupled to the corona when you start coming from the photosphere. Most of the heating will be dumped much below in the chromosphere. Now, if you look at all the, for example, this region where you have mixed polarities, right? Um, there is quite a bit of activity um, that you see in these regions in the lower lying heights and some activity also in the coronal heights. But most of it is happening here because that's where you see a, a dominant flux cancellation. So we have to look at different layers and then uh, discuss the role of flux cancellation. And only part of it actually then gets channeled to the corona. And uh, that is sufficient because corona actually is only requiring two, two orders of magnitude less energy than the chromosphere. So chromosphere heating is more important and then whatever remains will then get channeled to corona. Okay, perhaps a last question from Venkat Krishna. Can you please unmute and ask? Hi, hi Chitta. Uh, in the context of this, uh, your uh, presentation, uh, I'm thinking about this magnetic uh, carpet what people were talking about long ago. Mm -hmm. So what is the, how is this magnetic carpet in uh, relation to this kind of scenario? So magnetic carpet uh, that can be then also connected to the flux tube tectonics model proposed by Eric Priest in 2000, uh, early 2000. Okay. So the idea is that you have a lot of um, um, uh, flux elements that are distributed and all these give rise to several loop-like structures. Mm -hmm. And as they relatively move, they start developing separate rigs uh, at the boundaries where they interact. And that's where we see the coronal heating. But what we are now realizing with the new observations is that the magnetic flux is just not moving, but it's more dynamic. There is a lot of merging and splitting and cancellation and emergence, all that is happening. That was not completely taken into account in the magnetic carpet. And that is what makes the coronal heating more interesting also now. Sure, okay, thank you. Okay, now I think we can go to the next speaker. This was the last question. Okay, thank you, Pradeep, for such a nice talk. Thank you. And our next speaker is David Jess from Queen's, Univer uh, Queen's University, Belfast. So, and David will talk about uh, the uh, waves in lower chromo, uh, lower solar atmosphere. So, David's floor is now yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and of course, a, a very uh, warm good morning from the UK. Um, before I begin, I would just, of course, like to extend my thanks to the organizing committee for putting forward and organizing such an important event. Um, as Lewis highlighted towards the very beginning of his talk is that, of course, we've all had a very challenging year over the 2020 and early 2021. So I think any means in which we can come together as a community, and now that light is hopefully towards the end of the tunnel, um, is, is an excellent endeavor for all of us to pursue. So for those of you that have not had the opportunity to meet yet, uh, my name is David Jess, and I'm gonna be giving you a talk over the next 25 minutes as a little bit of a brief introduction into wave um, research, analysis, and of course, um, structuring of the sun's lower atmosphere. Okay, so to begin off with the talk, um, I think it's important just to um, suggest and, and put forward why waves are of course an important aspect of our day-to-day -day research. Now, by no means are waves a new phenomenon. Of course, waves have been seen for over 70 years now um, in the sun's atmosphere. And if we look back at these sort of historical observations dating back to the mid 1940s, you can see from Doppler grams of the sun's lower atmosphere. So in the photosphere and, and low chromosphere, that the entire solar atmosphere is indeed replete with oscillatory signals. So on these early observations that are shown on the right-hand side here, you can see there's a sunspot, and of course there's some Doppler grams that are showing this universal uh, oscillatory motion. Now, by modern standards, of course, these observations don't look quite as impressive as what we've seen from, I guess, the new generation of satellites and, and uh, telescopes like DKIST. But again, they were showing the way and moving forward with research to show that the sun's atmosphere has these dominant global oscillations across its entire surface. But as research, of course, developed, real important developments also came on board in the sense that it was shown that the magnetic field had a leading role 
in some of these magnetic um, uh, guided uh, waves that we see propagating from the sun's surface. Now, in this figure here to the right-hand side, published in the late 1970s, what essentially is plotted here is the phase angle between multi-level um, observations. And the positive phase angles here indicate that there are upwardly propagating waves. So not only now is there, are we in a position to see that we have oscillations at distinct levels of the sun's atmosphere, but through the analysis of phase between these different layers, we can actually now show that these waves are outwardly propagating um, by, by default. And this has important implications, of course, because if we have these magnetic fields, these magnetic fields are able to act as a conduit for this wave activity. It's able to then deliver and guide some of this mechanical uh, wave energy flux upwards into the higher regions of the sun's atmosphere. So where have we got to since those early pioneering observations in the mid 1940s? Well, thankfully we've come a long way, both in terms of the telescopes that we use as well as the instrumentation that we take advantage of. So for example, ground-based telescopes are of course right next to us on the ground, we're able to therefore revitalize them, invigorate them and provide new instrumentation to study the sun in even finer details. And of course, even forgetting about the advancements that DKIST is going to make for us, we can already see that telescopes that we've got listed here are providing us with resolutions down to the order of about 50 kilometers by the use of high order adaptive optics. Now, of course, if we combine those high resolution ground based telescopes with space borne observatories. This is then of course able to provide us with these long duration data sequences that might not necessarily be possible due to the day night cycles um, associated with, with ground based observatories. And of course they're able to give us these long duration time series which in the wave community is of paramount importance when it comes to giving us the frequency resolution to detect small scale fluctuations in the sun's atmosphere. And I think a really important point that's worth mentioning here is that, of course, related to balloon-borne experiments. So I think Sunrise here is a real pioneer when it comes to this type of activity because it, it bridges the gap between ground-based telescopes and their space-based um, equivalents, whereby you can get these virtually seeing-free observations without the necessary the telemetry restrictions you might have associated with, with space-based telescopes but also you can get them for continual long period durations, which of course then means that you're able to monitor a region on the sun surface for a long period of time, giving you that very high frequency resolution, but ultimately as well, you get the added advantage of being able to capture them with high cadence observations, as well as for continual durations of time. Now, I think what's really important is that the community as a whole can take advantage of all of these types of observations, and it means that we're now able to acquire observations from a variety of different facilities, but we're able to put them together and allow them to work in harmony. So things like high cadence imagers, fabry perro tunable filters, and indeed integral field units are now able to work in harmony together to give us a much better vantage point of the sun's lower atmosphere. So now that we have these capabilities at our disposal, what have we really been able to, to come up with? And I think just before we begin, a really useful example of this is if I just show you an image. Now here is an image of an active region that's been acquired from the Dunn Solar Telescope in the United States um, through a G-band filter. So here in this G-band filter, you can see the, the granulation that is in the sort of more quieter regions around the sunspot. You can see the penumbral structures, and of course you can see the umbra. Now, if we just studied that in a single band pass, we could of course be able to under and estimate oscillation characteristics within that field of view. But if we use multi observations in terms of multi lines, then what we can do is we can also then be able to link that to other regions of the sun's atmosphere. In this case, the hydrogen alpha absorption line, which samples the chromosphere. And we're able to couple one layer of the atmosphere with another and be able to continue on with these studies about showing how waves can gen be generated, how they can propagate, and ultimately be dissipated uh, or converted in different regions of that atmosphere. So what, under, what sort of scientific discoveries have really been, been achieved over the last few years? I think one of the really good examples here um, is uh, involving perhaps uh, data sequence that have been around for a few years, but being able to apply cutting edge next generation techniques to their analysis. 
And this is, of course, is what Rajaguru and colleagues did in 2019, where they studied observations coming from a sunspot using the Solar Dynamics Observatory. And what they found is that, of course, as one would expect, there's a, a, a lot of oscillatory power coming within this typical P mode spectrum of two to five millihertz. Now, if you look over at the right hand side, you can clearly see that we have a, a sunspot structure where we have the vertical magnetic fields isolated right inside that umbra. You've got the more inclined magnetic fields coming towards the penumbra and the periphery of that active region. Now, whenever we look upwards and we see the, where the energy flux, where the concentrated energy flux is coming from in a periodicity of about five minutes, we can see that it's actually originating in this periphery, in the sort of penumbral regions of this sunspot. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important for two reasons. One, of course, is that using these new techniques of doing a very high precision um, travel time analysis, Rajaguru and colleagues were able to see wave energy fluxes that were at least a factor of two larger than previous estimations, which shows that as we get down to the small spatial scales with better and better analysis techniques, we're starting to uncover a lot of sig signals and signatures that we may have overlooked previously. Now, in terms of the structuring of that atmosphere, you may have seen, of course, that this five minute power surrounds the umbral region. Now, I think this figure here put forward by Hegland and, and, and colleagues in 2011 very nicely shows why this is the case. Of course, in the center of the umbra where we have these vertical magnetic fields, of course, we're dominated by what is the cutoff frequency of the sun in the order of about three minute oscillations. But as we get the more inclined magnetic fields that are associated with the penumbral regions, of course, this modifies the effective cutoff allowing these longer period oscillations to propagate. So of course we can't restrict our spectral analysis into very narrow discrete regions. It means we have to be able to consider the full um, Fourier power spectra when it comes to studying wave motion. Now, as we move along, you know, we consider now this, this is evidence that there are a vast assortment of frequencies with huge amounts of energy propagating upwards from the depths of the sunspot structures in the photosphere upwards towards the chromosphere. But what happens to that wave energy as it reaches the chromospheric heights? Now, I think what's really important here is two pieces of work um, that were both published in 2018 uh, related to Houston and colleagues and Joshi and colleagues. And basically what they used is the spectropolarimetric techniques that Lewis has already introduced to us um, a short time ago. But now, of course, we're applying them to features, sunspots, that have much stronger signal to noise compared with these the smaller scale quiescent features. And what these, these authors were able to do was be able to apply inversion techniques to their observations to see what the response of the sun's atmosphere was to these propagating waveforms. Now, of course, we know that as these magnetoacoustic waves propagate upwards along the magnetic field lines in the umbra, as the density begins to decrease in as we leave the solar photosphere, the wave amplitudes, of course, naturally begin to, to grow larger, and eventually they increase the local sound speed, forming shocks. Now, it was put forward back in 2017 in a paper by Henriquez and colleagues that these shocks can actually cause a perturbation and they can cause the atmosphere of the umbra to be expanded slightly as a result of the shock through the process of an adiabatic expansion. Um, I think this was really put forward very nicely in the schematic diagram shown on the left-hand side here, whereby it was seen that if you looked right at the center of the shock forming region, that you actually saw the magnetic field strength in that particular region decreasing slightly in your observations as the shock front manifested. Now, that's not to say that the overall integrated field of the sunspot decreased. It just happened to be expanded slightly and therefore occupied a greater number of pixels in the surrounding area. But this is really good evidence to put forward and show that these shock fronts that develop in sunspot umbra are, of course, able to manipulate not only the temperatures and the densities, but also the structuring of the magnetic field in these chromospheric regions as well. Now, leading on from, from sunspot observations, we can also turn our attention to other types of dynamic features that occur within sunspots that are, of course, closely related to wave activity. Now, we mentioned before that the, the work of Joshi and, and Houston and colleagues was related to the development of magnetoacoustic shocks. But of course, 
evidence is now starting to grow that other types of shock fronts can also be found inside the umbrae of sunspots. Now, if we look at the, the diagram here on the, the left-hand side, Grant and colleagues in 2018 examined all of the shock features that they found inside along Fabry Perot. So this was the IBIS instrument at the Dunn Solar Telescope. And they looked at all of the shock fronts that were able to be spotted in this type of dynamic time series. And of course, if you look at the, the features that are very, very high magnetic field strengths, therefore they're at the center of the umbra with very vertical magnetic field concentrations, they of course exhibited mostly blue shifted uh, Doppler velocity. So very characteristic of the traditional magnetoacoustic shock fronts. However, whenever you start looking at the periphery, so the basically the umbra penumbra boundary of the sunspot, what they find is that there's another population of shocks. So in this case, you've got these heavily inclined magnetic fields, but here when the shock is being formed, it's not just the traditional blue shifts that we would expect from the magnetoacoustic waves, <clears throat> but instead it's actually a mixture of red and blue shifted plasma, which gave rise to the interpretation that this could be the result of alphine wave driven um, shock fronts in the solar chromosphere. <clears throat> now this of course has very important implications because as we move forward, more and more modeling work is going into um, looking at the modeling of shock fronts. And indeed as our inversion techniques and indeed as our observations are getting much, much higher resolution, we're able to start to pinpoint these types of interesting shock fronts that are occurring in sunspot umbra. And indeed, with these types of shocks like slow shocks, fast shocks, and intermediate shocks, and now then gives us another outlet for being able to dissipate wave energy in the solar chromosphere. <clears throat> now, I mentioned dissipation of wave energy. I think this is of a crucial distinction needs to be made here because <clears throat> often people consider dissipation to be also related closely to wave damping, whereas I think there often has to be a distinct difference between the two. Now, wave damping, of course, means that the signal is being reduced in whatever observation you're looking at. But it may also mean that that signal is just being converted into another format and maybe just lost from that band pass. Whereas dissipation actually shows us that some of the wave energy is being then converted into thermalized energy within that layer <clears throat> of the atmosphere. And I think that's something that's very, very important to make a distinction of whenever we're looking at where this wave energy goes as it propagates upwards into the sun's higher layers of the atmosphere. <clears throat> now, another discovery that I think was, was really put forward in last year was that in relation to resonance effects inside sunspot atmospheres. Now, what was put forward by both myself and from Felipe and colleagues was looking for the, the presence of resonant modes inside the chromospheric plasma of a sunspot. Now here, this was done in two different ways. <clears throat> Myself, what I did and my colleagues, is we looked at pixels across the umbra and we looked at the power law slope. So basically examining the Fourier power spectra of the velocity time series. We then looked at what the corresponding power law slopes were and through comparisons with numerical simulations, we're able to show that different thicknesses and different depths of that um, resonant cavity in the chromosphere was able to modify the power law slopes. Um, so therefore acting as a proxy for estimating the depth of the chromosphere. Now as a complementary approach, <clears throat> Felipe was able to look for nodes and able to look for phase flips inside that uh, chromospheric plasma as you move from the photosphere upwards towards the transition region. And what they noticed, of course, was that if you identify perhaps these nodes or you notice phase flips, this then helps to pinpoint also uh, the thickness and the structuring of the umbral atmosphere. Now, this has really important implications because just by studying two-dimensional time series of velocities or intensities, what it actually allows you to do is to be able to then develop a three-dimensional picture of what the sunspot chromosphere is looking at. And I think this is something that really needs to be taken forward in the, the years and decades to come to see if we can now really build up a full three-dimensional picture of what the sun's atmosphere is doing through the combined efforts of spectropolarimetric inversions. And of course, looking at the wave power spectra that we get from these features. 
<clears throat> now, I guess if we turn our attention away for, for the time being from these large scale global uh, magnetic features, I think something that's really important is if we look at some what the simulations are also showing us. So there's been a lot of development that has come from simulation techniques. And indeed, Martina Sikora and colleagues put forward this, this fantastic simulation to show the development of these jet-like spicular structures um, that we now take, of course, for granted, as Alphonse was telling us earlier today, in chromospheric observations towards the solar limb. Now, what was found here to be very interesting, is that, as I alluded to on my previous slide, is that we can always generate these types of wave motions. But what's important is how do these waves then contribute to the localized heating of the sun's atmosphere? <clears throat> now, in this case, it was found that ambipolar diffusion may play a leading role in this type of um, dissipation or thermalization of wave energy. <clears throat> and of course, this ambipolar diffusion comes about to the process that the, the solar chromosphere is made up of both ions and neutrals. So there's this natural interaction as the wave propagates through them, releasing the, and the, the, given the ability to release this wave energy in the form of heat. Now, I think what's a, <clears throat> a nice piece of follow-up work, it's actually only just recently been published, and it's basically looking at perhaps the, the counter propagation of these type two um, jet-like specular structures. Now, We've previously seen in the past these RREs and RBEs, so these rapid redshift events and these rapid blue shift events in chromospheric um, spectral diagnostics. However, what's really important here <clears throat> is that it's not just an apparent motion along the plane of sky, which then defines this as a rapid redshift event. Instead, the authors actually look at the downflowing characteristics of these features and found that then they're actually flowing downwards, the trajectories of these features are actually flowing back down towards the magnetic features that are on the solar surface. Now, <clears throat> this gives us a very clear indication that these could be the counter-propagating return flows associated with these type two uh, spicule oscillations. But as this is a very early study, more work of course needs to go into this in order to be able to see if this is the direct cause and effect of these specular structures. <clears throat> Now, if we come on to, um, I guess, related to these fine scale details in the chromosphere as well, um, Srivastava and colleagues were examining the look of these specular, fibrillar type structures in the chromosphere. And I guess what's really important is that if you outline one of these particular chromospheric characteristics, which is the, the dashed green line shown here, what is actually important to see is that on one side of the structure, it's dominated by blue shifted plasma, so plasma coming towards you. On the other side, it's dominated by plasma that's red shifted, so going away from you. So it therefore gives this fibrillar type structure a torsional type twisting motion. And this is why the authors then interpreted this as the signatures of a torsional alphane wave. Now, what's important here is that the high resolution observations that came from the Swedish Solar Telescope allowed frequencies that are as high as 40 millihertz, which in terms of periodicities is about 25 seconds, to be uncovered. Now, whenever you combine these periodicities with the phase velocities and densities of the local plasma, you can make an estimate of the energy flux in which they're carrying. And it's believed to be on the order of about 10 to the power of five watts per meter squared. So this huge amount of energy is now going upwards into the solar chromosphere. But that again comes back to the key question again as well, okay, <clears throat> we have this huge amount of energy which is being carried upwards into the outer chromosphere, but what happens to that energy? Does it just continue to be carried on as wave mechanical energy flux, or is it converted in some way into a method where we can thermalize it and provide heat into the chromosphere? <clears throat> now, thankfully, there's a lot of numerical and theoreticians working on this topic. And indeed, work has, recent work has gone on to show that if you then combine effects like the Hall and Beerman battery effects with these ambipolar diffusion terms that, that Martina Sikora and colleagues were putting forward, you can actually see that this gives an outlet for this mechanical wave energy flux to be converted into thermal energies in the sun's chromosphere. So what of course now we have to turn our attention to is ways in which we can actually measure this energy dissipation because then that will give us the conclusive proof that we need to be able to verify that these diffusive characteristics that have been modeled very nicely in simulations 
are also applicable to the real solar atmosphere. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned, is that you know this naturally leads on to a whole bunch of outstanding questions in the field of solar physics. Now, <clears throat> we know that you know if you do a very, very revolutionary study, you might be able to close one door in solar physics, but very regularly this will open two, if not more, doors of avenues for exploration. And one key question that I feel always keeps cropping up is that often whenever we're looking at these features, we assume that there's some form of cylindrical geometry that can be associated with these wave modes. Now, <clears throat> this goes back at a very traditional uh, vantage point from the early papers that were put forward by Edwin and Roberts. So in this seminal paper here shown on the left-hand side, we can see this very traditional cylindrical flux tube type geometry. Now, say for example, in this cylindrical flux tube, we drop into it a fluting mode. <clears throat> so this is a particular type of wave that of course then has this characteristic wave signature across the cross section of the magnetic flux tube. Now, the movie in the middle, hopefully this will be uh, playing for you now, shows what happens if we take this cylindrical flux tube and we then convert that into an ellipse. So what happens to that nice, perfect symmet symmet symmetrical observations of um, this fluting mode in a cylindrical geometry? What happens if we move it across now to an ellipse? And you can see that there's a vast change between one and the other. <clears throat> but of course, an ellipse still is not an accurate reflection of the real structuring of the sun's atmosphere. So on the right-hand side, I've now got a movie direct from, from Anwar al Dafiri, where they take this fluting mode structure in a basic ellipse and then turn it into a realistic boundary associated with a sunspot umbra. So now what we can see is that if you have this sunspot umbra and you look at the power signatures from that umbra, and you go back and you look at the power signals that originally were shown for this fluting mode inside a cylindrical waveguide, you can see that there is, it's complete chalk and cheese. They're totally different from one another. <clears throat> and this therefore shows us why it's really important to be able then to examine these features on the realistic structuring environment, because then you'll be able to relate better the power maps that we see to what perhaps the idealized mode is of oscillation. David, five minutes more. Perfect, thank you. So another outstanding question is of course, what happens to these fast mode waves? Now, we know that the sun's atmosphere gives us a huge amount of, of wave energy in the form of acoustic waves, magnetoacoustic, fast modes, alphane modes, et cetera. And there's been a wealth of studies that have shown in the low chromosphere, we do have these fast mode waves. So they're high phase velocities, and they've got, of course, intensity fluctuations that are related to the, the density perturbations of the wave. But why do we not see these in the outer regions of the sun's atmosphere, right up in the upper chromosphere? And perhaps this has to do with, of course, maybe the, the modes are converted, maybe they're reflected in some way, or maybe they're dissipated before they get up to those outer regions. Now, in order for us to better document if this is the case or not, of course, what we really need is we need accurate identification of the wave modes. And what would really help us is to have key information related to the plasma pressure and the magnetic pressure to see what the interplay is between the plasma and magnetic pressure and what the phase is between them in order to more accurately identify the wave modes. Now, this is not without problems and not without challenges. I think this figure shown in the bottom right-hand side very nicely shows this. It's a, taken from a flux tube model put forward by Brules and Solanke in 1993, and the visualization is done by Shaheen. But what you can see is that right at the top of the photosphere, where you've got all of the speeds of these different types of waves are very, very similar to one another. So therefore, if you want to be able to decouple perhaps a fast mode from an alphane mode, you're going to need to be able to estimate the velocities and the plasma parameters with a high degree of precision. And that's why we then return to these new generation of inversion codes that I guess Lewis has already mentioned in his talk, which will hopefully be able to pave the way forward. Now, I think as a, as a final outstanding question that I have is that we must never forget that we're always challenged by the fact that we're in an optically thick 
environment in the lower solar atmosphere. And I think this was demonstrated very clearly in the figure on the left-hand side here by Eklund and colleagues in a publication this year, where they, they looked at brightness temperatures in relation from, from Bifrost simulations to see how, they, of course, they might relate to ALMA radio observations. And what they found is that these dots outline the, um, the optical depth unity, so what essentially you're sampling from your observations during the development of a shock. And you can see that as the shock develops, <clears throat> the optical depth of unity very nicely traces that shock. But of course, as the shock propagates upwards into more diffuse plasma, it therefore starts to decouple itself from the optical depth unity location. And therefore, if you want to study the shock more and more as it propagates through the atmosphere, you then have to be able to make sure that you're sampling and monitoring and you understand what the contribution functions are that are coming from these developing wave-driven features. Now, I think, you know, as to, just to, to finish off this talk, I think it would be very important just to, to briefly highlight the challenges that, in my opinion, I don't think the challenges can be undertaken by observations alone or by theory or modeling alone. I think we're going to need to be able to combine cutting edge observations. So I mentioned already things like integral field units where we're able to get the high precision spectra, but from a two dimensional field of view. If we can then combine this with high precision tunable filters like the VTF that's gonna be coming online on DKIST hopefully within the next year or two, we'll be able to sample very readily large fields of view but with very high degradation, high precision spectral information. And of course, going on to multi-conjugate adaptive optics to give us the large fields of view that we so desire, but also to have them compensated through um, <clears throat> very high precision and diffraction limited seeing. But I think it's also worth mentioning that I, I genuinely feel that we're gonna be swamped with data over the next number of years, especially when DKIS starts ramping up and coming online um, to, its, to its fullest extent. And therefore, things like machine learning algorithms are also going to be very important for us, not only to be able to try and sift through this vast assortment of data, but also to then to provide us with the precision in things like spatially coupled inversions or being able to extract multi-component Doppler velocities from spectral time series. And I think the future is very bright, if you excuse the pun, I think the future is very bright in terms of solar physics. We have, of course, a vast assortment of telescopes that are coming online. I've got DKIST, which is pretty much ready to go um, as we speak. We have, of course, the MASS telescope already giving us the fantastic images of the sun's atmosphere already in India, which of course will then be leading on to the NLST. And as I mentioned at the very start, the next flight of sunrise uh, will be taking place in 2022. And I think this again will be a fantastic way to take these types of observations, the theory, the modeling, and machine learning approaches back into the future and uh, over the years and decades to come. So thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, David, for such a nice talk. So floor is open for questions now. Yeah, I see one question uh, from, let's see. Uh, Krishna Prasad, can you please unmute and ask? Uh, uh, hi, Dave. It's an excellent uh, overview. Thanks for that. So I just have one question uh, uh, regarding the uh, the sunspot uh, uh, shape and sunspot oscillations as a whole. How do you picture these uh, oscillations with respect to what we see in uh, Corona, for example, the individual loops oscillating independently, and then if you think of sunspot oscillations as a whole? Yeah, that, that's a very good point, Krishna. Um, I think, you know, for, for this, we were, you know, this assumption that the authors had here was that the sunspot is, is oscillating as one entire macroscopic um, coherent structure. Now, I, whether this is viable or not, I think is something that needs to be investigated. There has been work over the last number of years that have shown that the, the, the overall umbra can oscillate in, in coherency whereby you have a, a very constant phase between the oscillations across the diameter of the umbra. So it might not be completely out of question to have the, the umbra acting as one coherent body. Um, now, of course, this might break down once you start adding in more complex issues like light bridges or even, you know, start separation between the different parts of the umbra. But I think we you know, obviously you have to start somewhere. 
And I think maybe just considering this as a one macroscopic coherent source, seeing how the perturbations then affect the, the power maps that you get associated with that is probably the, the first steps. And then from that, of course, we might be able to then break it up into um, what the observations are actually telling us to and seeing if we can then match somehow the phase of, from the observations and feeding that back in to the simulations to see if we can uncover the true genuine wave mode from the from from theory. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question is from Venkata Krishnan. Can you please unmute and ask? Uh, uh, I, uh, I, I, I was wondering about very high frequency waves which you view uh, looking on the disk, waves propagating upwards. And for them, the wave and the wave num wave length is much smaller than the so-called uh, line forming line formation heights. So are you able to resolve them and find out the shocks actually propagating upwards? So I, I think that's that's a very good question because I think you know once you get into that very high frequency regime, then of course that's where many of these dissipation processes, you know, turbulent mixing, et cetera, are, are taking place. Now, there's often a, a bit of a balancing act here for looking at such high frequency oscillations. Um, normally, when it comes to the ground-based observations, many of the, the, the data is combined through speckle reconstruction techniques to give us the diffraction limit. But of course, that comes at the, the compromise that the, the, the temporal resolution is decreased. Now, some studies have gone, indeed, Krishna Prasad did a study um, a few years ago now that looked at oscillations that went up to on the order of about one hertz. So looking at oscillations that went pretty high frequency, but it's very difficult to extract what could be a real signature from those high frequencies from what is maybe just the generic white noise that you're getting from your, your detector. Now, I think indeed, I think really if we're going to be studying these very high frequency terms, I guess if you consider just a standard K-omega diagram, if we're going up to these very high frequencies, we also need very high spatial resolutions. And I think to turn the question back around, I think that in order to more accurately look at this in the near future, I think that's where DKIST is going to be of paramount importance because it will give us the high temporal resolution, but also the high spatial resolution we need to get up to these higher regions of, of this K-omega space. But uh, will, the, will it address the height resolution? I mean as the waves propagate upwards. Well, I, I guess that also comes then, we, we need to make sure that we understand very formally where the formation of these shocks is occurring. Um, I guess work there in that paper that I referenced, there's the, the Grant et al. work in 2018, showed that a lot of these shocks are developing from heights as low as 200 kilometers up to 14 or 1500 kilometers. So there's a very big height span but if we're able to perhaps use inversions of these more high frequency components to isolate the, the layer in which they are um, being formed to much higher precision, then this will help us then uncover the energy flux and, and, and how that contributes to the, to the propagation of energy and thermalization into the higher layers. Okay, thank you. Okay, and I think now we can go to the next speaker, the last speaker of the session. Yeah, thank you, David, for such a nice talk. So our thank next you. and uh, last speaker is Sajal K. Dhara from ISOL, and he will show some observations on the spatial variation of strontium line uh, regarding this card scattering polarization signal. It's simple. Hello. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes, Sajal, please. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hello everyone, uh, I'll speak about the observation on spatial variation of strong CN 4607 angstrom um, spectral line, that scattering projection signal, which we observed with Zimpol at Gregor Telescope, and this work is done at Irsol, Switzerland. So why strong CN spectral line? Because it shows one of the strongest scattering polarization signal in the visual uh, solar spectrum, and that scattering signal it can be more than even 1% when we observe close to the limb, like in, at mu equal to 0 0.1. So this particular spectral line is sensitive to the Hanley effect and can be used as an excellent diagnostic tool for the presence of weak turbulent magnetic field in the quiet photosphere. The amplitude of these signals are expected to vary, and this could be due to the 
local variation of the magnetic small scale magnetic field between the granules and intergranular regions or could be the anisotropy of the radiation field so the one of the aim of this project is to detect this variation and finally to investigate the unresolved turbulent magnetic field of the quiet solar photosphere so there are some difficulties to measuring this variation due to the limited of spatial and spectral resolution so for particular uh, measurement if you want to detect this variation we should have like we should have the spatial resolution around 0.1 arc second and sensitivity of the instrument should be 10 to the minus 4. So few attempts had been done previously by spectropolarity measurement by Malarbe et al. 2007 and Bianda et al. 2018. And for these two measurements, they tried to observe this variation at mu equal to 0 0.3. And all these both measurements, they found that this variation is positively correlated with the photospheric intensity. So that means higher variation observed at the granular region than the intergranules. But in contrary to this observation, there is a Stokes filter graph observation by Zeuner et al. 2018. For their measurement at mu equal to 0 0.6, they observed this variation of these signals is anti-correlated. And they also found the structural variation of these signals at, at um, solar photosphere. So in order to continue this study, we uh, had a observation campaign at Gregor, and we tried to observe at different limb dis distances how this spatial variation acts over the intensity. So our observation campaign was at Gregor telescope between 13th June to 27th of June 2018, and we use our Zimpol polarimeter. Uh, so Zimpol polarimeter is a double ferroelectric crystal modulator with a polarizing beam splitter and which we install before the spectrograph slit at Gregor telescope. And, and the Zimpol polarimeter, uh, this Zimpol camera, which we install at the spectrograph room. So this polarimeter uh, has, uh, can obtain simultaneously full stroke spectra. And this uh, modulation rate of this uh, double ferroelectric crystal has one kilohertz frequency. So in this way, we can minimize that spurious effect by that uh, intensity variation due to the atmospheric strain. And for particular hour measurement, we the spectrograph slit which we have used, which covers around 0.3 arc second by 47 arc second, that means we can and observe like a 47 arc second spatial scale uh, with a spectral resolution around 10 million strom. So when we observe with the Zimpol, we have to follow the certain procedure before the observation. So here I am just giving a brief outline of this. So first we have to calculate the Zimpol camera timing parameter because which is important to reduce the systematic effect that might be introduced by that large instrumental polarization. So after um, obtaining this timing parameter, we go for the next step, which is that polarimetric calibration. For this particular um, observation, we use that uh, polarimetric unit, which is uh, installed at F2 of the Gregor telescope. From there, we obtain the demodulation matrix and which we use for our analysis of the data later on. Then we take the flat field correction, uh, which we take that quiet photosphere by moving the telescope at disk center. Then we do the scientific observation. For that, for our observation, uh, we place the slate um, close to the solar limb to the solar disk, like in different steps, like from 0 0.2 mu equal to 0 0.8, and even at the disk center. And every positions we have obtained several frames. It depends on the uh, seeing observing condition. And for our measurement, we always uh, use that adaptive optic system uh, to lock the region over the time of observation. So here is the list of observation which we could uh, manage to get. Uh, so if you see that limb distance uh, we have from 0 0.2 to 0.8, even on the disk center. And, and we try to avoid as much as uh, the active region or any plages region. So we have to choose different, different solar limb. And depends on that seeing condition, which was varied from five centimeter to around 10 centimeter during our observation. So we take different frame. So when we observe at mu equal to 0 0.2, as we know that scattering projection signal is higher close to the limb, so we need to obtain very few number of frames. But when we go to the close to the disk center, as though contrast between the granules and intergranules are higher, 
but the stimulus is very low. So we have to obtain more frames so that we can later on average to reduce the uh, RMS noise and get the better signal. So when we observe 0.5 to 0 0.8, uh, even at the disk center, we have taken more than 100 frames. So here, one of the example of our data, uh, which was taken on 16 June for mu by to 0 0.8. Here you can see that slit jaw image, and this is the slit position. The contrast of between the granules are granules are very high, and for particular observation, uh, uh, the seeing condition was like a fridge parameter was six to ten centimeter, and in this good seeing condition, that we obtained the spatial uh, resolution around 0 0.6 half second. And for our observation, we obtained 125 frames, which covers almost 14 minutes. And this is the uh, Stokes I. And if you take a time span, if you obtain the time map um, for this observation, you can see that uh, evolution of the granules and intergranular region uh, along the slate over the time. Here you can see that uh, these two regions are um, very nicely visible. But when we observe at mu equal to 0 0.2, so this contrast between the granules and intergranules is very poor. And as you can see, there is a flat region which also is not very well observed. So we move the slit away from this and we take our observation, which we, we contain around 80 frames. So it's around nine minutes of observation. And if you make a time space diagram, you can see few times we have we can um, along the slits, the Contrast between these regions are very well visible, but sometimes this, due to the poor seeing condition, we can't even have this uh, uh, contrast between two of those regions. So we have to visually display all the frames and discard the images for our final analysis. So this is very tricky. So when we observe close to the disk center, as we have a very good contrast, we can make a, a um, make a algorithm so that we can sub we can take the good frames, but when we go to the close to the limb, but we cannot do this uh, automatic algorithm. So we have to display individual frames, and then we have to use for our final verification. So here, one of the example is mu equal to 0 0.4, where you can see uh, this uh, time space map, this evolution of the granules are in, and intergranules are very nicely visible, but in between some places are there where it is not uh, well defined. So we have discussed this frame. So in this particular measurement, uh, I have applied both uh, automatic algorithm to separate the frames as well as the visual uh, visual display of individual frames. And to improve, increase the to increase the signal to noise ratio, we have uh, taken like an image window for part particular this measurement. We we have taken that 15 images, then we averaged and find out that uh, full Stokes vector IQUV. So here you can see that uh, scattering signals is very high in this uh, particular positions of measurement. And our aim is to, to correlate that how this uh, amplitude of the signals are related with this uh, intensity of that photosphere. So for that, what we have done, we take a cut from this, uh, Stokes I vector, and, and we obtain that normalized intensity profile. So higher intensity represents that granular region, and lower intensity represents the uh, intergranular region in this case. And to obtain the amplitude of the signal, so every spatial direction, we take a, a profile of this uh, measurement, and then finally we treat a Gaussian. And for all measurement, we store these parameters for our final, um, final calculation. So here you can see that when we take the profile at one up second, 17 up second, 35 up second, and 42 up second, for example, so you can see there is a variation of this amplitude of these signals. So if you plot of this uh, amplitude of this signal with respect to the intensity, you can see there could be a correlation. So finally, plot a scatter plot and made a linear fit over it. And this particular plot has been created from 980 points. And if you made a a correlation coefficient and which is which we obtain, obtained around 0 0.27. So it is like a positively correlated. So in the similar process, uh, so for our all measurement, if you see from when 0. Point, um, mu equal to 0 0.2 to 0 0.8 when go, so this uh, RMS noise or individual frames are different. So uh, almost close, but uh, when we uh, measure uh, close to the limb, 
is, as the signal is very high, we can average over the few number of frames so that that is not effect for our measurement. But when we go to the close to the disk center, as noise is very high and signal is very low, so we have to average over long times. But at the same time, we have to keep in mind that uh, evolution of granulation should not be that when you are averaging the longer frames, it should not be more timing than the evolution of granulation, a particular region. So for this, it's a little bit tricky because when we are measuring at 0.7 at, or 0.8 or disk center, when you are averaging over more than six minutes or seven minutes, so when we see that time space uh, diagram, we do not see that uh, like a few granular regions are not present later on. So we cannot use like a, we cannot go for more than six minutes or seven minutes. So that we have to take a decision that up to where we can uh, average the uh, frames. And for all the measurement, when we, we estimated that our spatial resolution, which varies from single frame to like a, a average of 10 frames or 20 frames. So it comes around 0 0.6 of second to 0 0.9 of second. So, so just three minutes more. Uh, here is the scatter plot for all the measured region uh, where you can see this uh, amplitude of the signal is uh, almost linearly co correlated, um, positively correlated with the intensity variation. And the statistical significance of individual measurement uh, of R, like a fridge parameter, is estimated by obtaining the p-value. So p-value is the probability of finding the R, which, uh, this, uh, which says that uh, null correlation between the intensity and amplitude is true. That means when we obtain the lower p-value, that gives that 99.9% percent probability of discarding the null hypothesis. So it does not mean that it supports the positive correlation, but it discards the null hypothesis that you have to keep in mind in this case. So the obtained p-value for all the cases, we got like a 10 to minus three, even below that. So which give that 99.9% .9 confidence level of each measurement. And coming to the disk center of the measurement, for our measurement, uh, if you, this is the time space diagram of um, the evolution of granular and intergranular region. When you average over six minutes and we did not find any amplitude or like a signals at this particular measurements. So what we can conclude that this spatial variation of Q by I, uh, the scattering projection signals uh, at this particular line and exists at different limb distances and which is comparable to the granular scale because we obtain at, uh, our spatial resolution around 0 0.6 of seconds. And this our correlation studies suggest that, that this polarization signal inside the granular region is higher than the intergranular range. But here is the twist is that there is a uh, theoretical simulation by Delpin et al. by 2018. They shows that with a higher uh, spatial and spectral resolution with the uh, highest um, polarimetric sensitivity, this correlation will be the negative. So for to continue this study, actually what I can conclude that whatever observed result we presented here is mostly limited by that available photons statistics and seeing condition. So to validate this uh, measurement again, so we need very high spatial resolution in a large telescope. For that, uh, we have done a feasibility study using a febrifero interferometer as a and and a broadband strontium filter which we have a test at the gregor telescope but i am not going to details of this but what i can say in future direction we could have a second generation instrument which we can use as a dickist thank you Thank you, Saja, for such a nice description of scattering polarization using strontium line. So, floor is now open for questions. So, please go ahead. I don't see any hands. Ah, yeah, there is one. Yes. Okay, Oscar. Okay. Yes. Unmuted. Yes. Unmuted uh, so, Saja, uh, what what? What does that mean, really, a positive correlation of the strontium signal in terms of the turbulent magnetic field? What does that mean for the turbulent magnetic field? Yes, uh, so when you are talking about the positive correlation, that means that uh, higher amplitude of the signals is obtained at the granular region, 
where the relatively the uh, higher magnetic field than the intergalvanic sorry lower magnetic field in the uh, with respect to the intergalvanic regions okay thank you there are no more hands uh, if there are no more questions sorry then we can thank us all the speakers of the session and wind up the session okay so thank you to all the speakers for their time and also such a nice uh, talks by everyone and participation from all the participants for question and answer so i hand it to iia for further uh, procedure okay thank you me too Uh, hi everyone. I think uh, science oral sessions are over now. I invite you all to look at the posters. You can view the posters in the in the conference website where you see a button for viewing post view posters. To view the posters, you need to log in into the website, and uh, the login is the same login which you use to register for the conference. So I will encourage all of you to. View the posters, and you can alternatively you can also uh, visit the Slack channel. And the Slack channel, you can again view the posters and ask questions to the poster presenters. So uh, I uh, right now we will close this uh, Zoom. We will get back about six fifteen. 6:15 p.m. IST Indian Standard Time. Uh, so it's about two hours, two two hours, fifteen minutes from now. So go ahead, view the posters and interact in the Slack channel, and we will be back at 6:15 IST. Okay, I will close this uh, Zoom meeting right now. Thank you. See you all a little later. Yeah. 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 Yeah.